here and we're going to talk about indecent imagery and sex. Okay, so you need to know some stuff about this topic and I'm going to take you back through time a little bit so that you can see the world from the point of view of your parents. I'm kind of like the ghost of Christmas past on this one, like uh, the, the ghost from Christmas Carol, but it just regards your dodgy selfies when you were trying to look hot, okay? Okay, so here we are. I'm going to take you back to the 1980s. Technology really sucked. Everyone used landlines. There was no internet at all. Computer games were pretty dreadful. Um, and if you had a mobile phone, it looked like this. Really nice. So, no social media, no text messages, no WhatsApp, no video conferencing, no Spotify, no YouTube, four channels on the TV, and your television looked like this. Oh, by the way, my mum's car looked like this. Okay, but despite not having any decent technology at all, what we did still have was paedophiles and child predators. Okay, how does that work? Anyway, these guys still existed and in the majority of circumstances, we're talking about men with a maladjusted sexual interest in children. So back in the day, the way that they used to operate, which was still highly illegal, they would literally have to develop the film and then physically print the imagery and reproduce those photographs for other paedophiles who wanted to see them. The offenders used to work together in a network. It's what became known as a paedophile ring. And the police would try to infiltrate that network through the use of covert or undercover tactics. They'd get hold of a, a list of the, the mailing list that all of these images would be sent to, they would have to go down that list and prosecute every single one systematically, searching their homes for evidence. So they'd recover any incriminating evidence and prosecute them under the relevant sexual offences and obscenities laws of the day. Over time, those laws have been updated and they've evolved, but generally speaking, the content that they handled illegally and shared has always been referred to as indecent imagery of children and quite wrongly in the tabloid press as child pornography. The imagery that we're talking about is of a sexual nature and it shows children under the age of 18, the age at which a person is recognised to be an adult, usually naked and or involved in sexual acts. Of all the offenders that there are out there, and there's always been a bizarre hierarchy of acceptability around crime. Sex offenders have always been in the lowest and most despised category of all. Within the category of sex offenders though, one particular group has always been the lowest of the low, and that is child sex offenders. So keep that in mind. I'm going to come back to this point, it will be relevant. The point for now is that such people have always sadly existed, they do exist, we've always had to be sure that we're keeping ourselves safe and that we stay aware of these facts. Fast forward with me now, we're going to go to the 1990s. Around the middle of the 1990s, something amazing started to happen. We still didn't really have mobile phones, definitely not like what we have today, but the internet started to change the world. I sent my first email, and in this decade I also went off to university. When I got there, everything was pay phones. By the time I left, everyone had a mobile phone. It didn't have the internet on it, and it still didn't have a camera, so they were really basic, but this is where the journey starts to happen. The internet and the mobile phone were in motion. Things were starting to evolve. So come with me now and we'll go to the 2000s. 
Once the millennium hit, we thought we were in the future. Our TVs were still awful. We still couldn't pause or record our favorite programs. And if we wanted something from Netflix, they used to have to post as a DVD to watch. And then we had to get it posted back to, to them. But we were moving forward. Okay, in 2005, I got my first mobile phone that had a camera. And it looked like this. Now, this was a huge game changer. And people were still using cameras with film in them, so they had to pay to get the images developed or printed. Now, at this point, people are starting to have a camera on hand all the time. And they're starting to get privacy around what they photograph. And they can photograph whatever they want. And 2005 was a big year for another reason. Facebook had just turned one year old, okay? And social media was starting to happen. All of a sudden, people could take a photograph and while you didn't have the internet on your phone, yeah, I know it was lame, you could upload the image to your photo. You could upload the image to your computer and from there, you could get it onto the internet. Now, remember, it wasn't until 2007 that Steve Jobs and Apple changed everything by launching the iPhone. And then what was known as the smartphone sparked a huge revolution. So before 2010 hit us, at the touch of a button, you could take a very intimate photograph of yourself and you could upload it directly to the internet, or you could share it, you could message it to people. The options for public self-humiliation seemed absolutely endless. It was only at this point in time that sexting really became possible, at least in the way that we start to think about it today. Before then, it was about sending flirty words through text messages, guys asking women what they were wearing, that kind of thing. Today, suggestive and flirty messages can lead to much more graphic things. And we were starting to get there by the time 2010 happened. So let's turn the corner and go into that decade, the 2010s. Video conferencing and video calls. Wow. What could this possibly lead to? Who would possibly imagine that any of this technology developed through millions and billions of pounds in research and development could possibly lead to cyber sex? We had a situation back there in the 1980s where paedophiles and sexual predators had to physically print their images and distribute them through a mailing list. As the decades have passed, this burden, this natural barrier to their activities, has just got easier and easier. We now have a situation where cloud storage and the dark net can make billions in revenue from indecent imagery that such people pay subscriptions to. One step further is the pseudo image and the deep fake, where an image of someone else's body can be replaced with someone else's head or likeness People can be made to look like they're doing things that they're not. Bikini shots can be adapted. Even clothing garments can be removed. It gets creepier and creepier. The law that punished paedophiles in the 1980s, the 1990s, and the 2000s onwards are now genuinely a problem for teenagers. An indecent image of a child is defined as some, something where it depicts a person who's under the age of 18. And the content of that image clearly has a sexualized content or suggestion within that image. There's a gray area on some images, but most indecent images are clearly indecent. And the majority of people would look at them and recognize them as such. This is exactly the same law that was attached to, yes, you remember what I said, the lowest of the low, the worst and the most socially despised of all criminals, the child sex offender. When two people, both of whom are under 18, take photos of themselves, 
not each other, but selfies, that are of a sexual nature and for a sexual purpose, they are both equally guilty of creating indecent imagery of children, even if it is themselves. If they send those images to each other in exchange, they're now distributing indecent imagery of children, much as the 1980s paedophile was. This is why when a police officer calls a parent on the phone and says, I need to bring your son or daughter into the police station, I'm afraid they've been distributing indecent imagery of children. Your mum or dad will very nearly drop the phone and will probably want to rush to the bathroom so they can be sick. Their mind goes immediately to that paedophile from the 1980s that they grew up being taught to despise. They know that if you have that on your record, your ability to get a job is pretty much a scorched earth event. Getting into university, travelling abroad, all bad news. This is super scary stuff. So here we are, back in the 2020s. I'm a lot older and a lot less good looking. Thankfully, I get less acne and I can drive now. The technology in the 2020s is amazing. It's incredible. We all have the ability to publish our thoughts and our feelings and exactly what we're doing in a million different ways. We can podcast, we can stream live videos, we can YouTube, we can Vimeo, we can TikTok, we can social media to our heart's content. For most of us, that doesn't go much further than playing a few computer games and uploading pictures of cats and dogs and what we're eating for dinner. But the power's immense. Do you realise that when man landed on the moon in 1969, thanks to NASA and the Apollo 11 mission, they had about seven main computers to achieve that with. They spent in total about one and a half million dollars on each computer. The total computing power in each of those computers is not as great as the computing power that's available in your Apple iPhone fast charger. That is pretty sick. The thing is that it's a bit like being given a huge powerful supercar and no driving license or driving lessons. So we end up in a situation where young people are getting themselves into horrendous trouble because the technology is being misused to explore sex. There's been an explosion of pornography and the availability of pornography is absolutely everywhere. Even now, social media is loaded with imagery and video that 10 to 20 years ago would definitely be graded as pornography. And that's not me being prudish or old fashioned. Music videos sell themselves through displays um, of sex all the time. And you can walk into a barber's on frankly any high street on any given day and such videos will be playing while children are getting their haircuts with their dads. And people have been encouraged to participate in pornography, not just watch it. OnlyFans as a platform is now worth billions of pounds and they've just made an announcement about restricting the amount of pornography and what types of sexual imagery can be uploaded onto that platform. But there's definitely pressure, particularly on young women, to consider sex working and selling their identity in a way that can make them uh, a revenue stream and some income. For a young person under 18 to engage in this, or simply to start sending nudes to boyfriends and girlfriends, is to start committing sexual offences. It's all about creating and distributing indecent imagery. The circumstances where young people send each other materials often results in cruel humiliation and immense feelings of guilt and regret. When the imagery leaks, the sheer curiosity and gossip and scandal mean that the pictures and the images spread like wildfire and run through an entire school before anyone is in any kind of a position to stop it. That person, that young man or young woman, has to contemplate the feeling of not knowing 
if the person that they're speaking to has seen them naked or not. They have to live knowing that if the images have been hosted on the internet, they'll never get them back or be sure that they've been eradicated. There's an incredible anxiety about all this, about ruined reputations, about future partners seeing them, about being perceived as sexually promiscuous, of being targeted with abuse and with threatening behaviour by people who are jealous or judgmental or just angry or argumentative. I've known girls who've become reclusive for months, scared to leave the house because of making such a mistake. And society is still more judgmental of girls who make these mistakes when compared to boys. It's the same mistake, but boys are often given far more chance to move on and to move forward and to laugh it off. For young women and girls, the fear of slut shaming is absolutely real. There's a vindictive quality to what I've witnessed about how other girls go after such peers with fierce name calling, calling them sluts and skets and bitches. The threats are never far away and boys start to get judgmental. There's an expectation that the person who made this mistake must have loose moral boundaries. And in reality, it's such an easy mistake to make. The modern phone makes it so easy to take a photograph and send it. Capturing a video and sharing it is nothing. Starting a video call, live streaming what you're doing, all of this stuff is so easy. While some people look at the backlash that people face for making these mistakes as natural consequences, there's absolutely nothing right about the judgmentalism or the double standards of gender bias and sexism. This doesn't make teen sexting right or safe though. I want to tell you about a cautionary tale. Is one of the most prominent outlets for a broad spectrum of pornography available on the internet. Mia Khalifa remains in the top 10 viewed women on that website with close to 1 billion views. What a lot of people don't know about Mia Khalifa is that she was only involved in pornography for a very short window of time. She made 11 videos. She states that she left the industry having been paid just $12,000, which is somewhere between eight and 9,000 pounds. She hasn't been involved in pornography since 2015, and she was involved for a lot less than one year. What she sacrificed was any control over the images of her own body. She's spoken out publicly to say that she believes that pornography is an industry that seeks to trap young women in contracts when they're vulnerable. There is still an active website operating under her name and she has no control over it and receives no income from it. She still receives abusive messages and even death threats. She has said that she would pay anything to get rid of the images of herself from the internet. And she's been quoted in newspapers saying, Girls, don't do it. It's not worth it. Those 11 videos will haunt me until I die. And I don't want another girl to go through that because no one should. The truth is, a generation of young people are growing up today facing choices and decisions that a previous generation never had to make. There are offences that can be committed that were impossible only a few years ago. Our lack of technology protected us when we were younger. Now the pressure is on us to make the right decisions about what we share and what we publish in social media, in private messages and in all of our online behaviours. We have to pay attention to these choices and not take them for granted. We must, above all, understand that sharing sexual imagery of people under the age of 18 is a criminal offence. Making those images is a criminal offence. Showing those images is a criminal offence. These are offences that nobody wants to be recorded for. While the current guidance from the National Police Chiefs Council is to avoid criminalising young people where possible for making such mistakes, the law in England and Wales is still very much in place where it always has been. I do believe in the ability of young people 
to sit and think and consider the fact this is a big issue, an important issue, and one that you really don't want to get the wrong side of. I'm sure when you consider all of this information, you will see how to keep yourself safe. But only you can decide for yourself what you're going to do. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.